Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ask Key Anything presented by Mosier Consulting. I'm your host, Angel Leon, Mosier's HR advisor. Today's episode is a special breakout episode from our data and analytics team. This conversation takes place outside the continuing talk between Sean McAdams and Warren Seifre. Sean is joined today by Tim Mortz. Tim is a senior solutions architect at Databricks, a data and AI company that helps data teams solve the world's toughest problems. He is a data scientist, big data architect, an Apache Spark evangelist, and he is passionate about helping customers minimize effort and maximize value with their data. He has extensive experience implementing analytics on data small and large, as well as with providing technical leadership to data science teams. This week, they'll be discussing the evolution of data architecture for analytic workloads. So without further ado, here are Sean and Tim for this week's episode of Ask Anything. All right, thanks, Angel. Hey, uh, Sean McAdams here, Vice President of uh, Data and Analytics. And today I'm joined with Tim Lords at Databricks. Tim, how are you doing? Great, Sean, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so glad to, uh, to have you here. And today we're, we're gonna get to talk about the evolution of data architecture, specifically for analytic workloads. Um, so we'll, we'll describe basically the three main ones that kind of exist today, and we'll talk about um, what purpose were they serving for the business at the point in time they were introduced. Um, but before we do that, before we go through that, I think it'd be great uh, if uh, you know they hear a little bit about us and our background, because we all have a different lens by which we look at uh, data architecture that's for analytic workloads, do a little in, you know, intros and stuff uh, as well. So uh, Tim, what is sort of your background and involvement with uh, the data architectures for analytic workloads, what you're kind of doing now, just to give them an idea on how you're approaching this particular topic. Yeah, thanks, Sean. So I, uh, I kind of finished up my graduate studies right as Hadoop was becoming a thing, probably before machine learning had really uh, adopt, been adopted widely. So I came into a world where you may, might have done some you know, batch processing with Hadoop, mm -hmm. um, but you know, most data still lived in data warehouses. And if you were an analytic person like I was, I'd done a lot of grad work and, and more of conventional statistics and operations research. That was work you did on uh, small data locally, right, in your own system after you've done exports from wherever the enterprise data warehouse is. So that's kind of how I grew up in this space. But I was working in a, a government agency that was adopting Hadoop as a standard for doing their, their large scale data processing. So got involved in some architectural work there, uh, eventually became more hands on uh, doing Spark development on Hadoop uh, and eventually, you know, enjoyed that a lot, saw the potential of what Spark could do and what, you know, correctly architecting your data lake could do. And uh, I had an opportunity to join Databricks a couple of years ago, right? Databricks. Uh, being founded by the same people who created Apache Spark originally. So I uh, kind of jumped from the consulting and services side over to the, the vendor side uh, in selling software. And now I get to see people using these concepts all over the place and kind of on the, the, the forefront of this uh, battle, if you want to call it, between data warehouses and, and data lakes and, and the lake house. So uh, it's a great time to be in this field, um, really enjoying it. and. Uh, you know, it's, it's fun to see value being created by people using data correctly. Sean, over to you. Yeah, so we, we had um, similar, similar intros into, uh, into data um, and into, into specifically data architecture for these analytic workloads. So my introduction, so I got started in data predominantly within data exchange between health systems. And so doing um, translation, if you will, from one system to another system, um, all in healthcare, number of different formats, which was also also for uh, government agency. So for, for centers of Medicare and Medicaid services predominantly. And um, so my first decade, my first decade in work was doing that type of work. Um, and due to the Affordable Care Act, there was um, a, uh, a mandate, if you will, for the creation of a fraud prevention system for, for Medicare. And so I got tapped to come into that government program because I had experience with all these different disparate systems 
that this program was now tasked with bringing in and uh, doing analytics on. And so uh, that was uh, 2011. That was my first intro to uh, Hadoop, which to your point was predominantly a batch oriented data processing thing. That's what we were doing. Uh, but I did have the uh, privilege to, to uh, you know, help um, author two of the first three predictive models on that system um, that, that uh, leveraged uh, Hadoop as well. At that time though, we had to write it like in Java, you know, there wasn't any tools and stuff. So my background at looking at analytic workloads um, kind of comes into the middle of the story we're going to tell because I didn't grow up designing EDWs, um, enterprise data warehouses that we're, we're, we're going to talk about. So that's great. I think that's it's good to set a foundation for how we look at this particular topic. Now for this topic, we're going to talk about basically three architectures. And before we go into, you know, um, what were the main drivers of how they helped the business, let's define these things. So the three things we're going to talk about, um, enterprise data warehouse or EDW. Um, we may also say, you know, operational data store or data mart or how, whatever a design that EDW is. Um, I would define, you know, EDW as, um, a predominantly uh, an architecture that was set aside specifically for reporting business intelligence um, started in the 80s, still used today, uh, highly relational in the data technology that's chosen um, to offer those particular services. You have any, I mean, how, what would you say about that definition, high level of an enterprise data warehouse? Yeah, I think that's that's very fair. And it was a, a great way to one centralized data you have, right? Especially in the era where data was sitting on mainframes, right? Or files, file stores. And for the common person who needed to get reporting off of that, right? That was a whole different skill set. So it was great to be able to centralize your data in one place with uh, some standard APIs, if you will, right? So for enabling BI, like business intelligence reporting. Um, if you could do that on reliable data, on data that performs well, and um, you know, present it out to tools that, you know, that the common analyst would be able to access, then that was a big success. And I, you know, that, that legacy is still very much, I think, alive across every industry today. Yeah, and, and there were paradigms for how you organize data that came out of that, right, dimensional modeling, all of these things. You also got the benefit um, for being able to persist historical data. So as operational systems maybe changed or maybe didn't have the ability uh, to store everything or wanted to be more performant, so let's offload, you know, this historical stuff somewhere else and we still wanna be able to use it um, for reporting. Uh, EDW helped solve those particular challenges. Um, and yeah, created, you know, uh, let's say probably even some early adopters in the 70s, but you've seen them start to exist within in the 80s. Um, and, and by the time that this next evolution happened, Data Lake, which uh, I'll just generically say the 2010 decade, and a lot of people probably got more introduced in 2011, uh, a lot of organizations had some form of an enterprise data warehouse. So you move into, you know, Data Lake and I would define, you know, uh, Data Lake as the ability to uh, store data, but it didn't have to necessarily be relational, right? I, and I think it, it's initial introduction into society, a lot of people had Data Lake and Hadoop as kind of synonym, synonymous because we still lived in a predominantly on-premise um, environment. So a lot of people had, uh, th there was a, a broad adoption yet of these cloud technologies, cloud talk technologies delivering uh, data architectures. Um, those things weren't there quite yet in this 2010 area. So Data Lake comes along and uh, it allowed you to do sort of those three Vs of big data, right? You could store data, any variety at any velocity at any volume, predominantly at the time synonymous with 
um, with Hadoop. What are some other, you know, um, benefits that a data lake uh, paradigm helped organizations as it relates to analytic workloads uh, in, you know, in that 2010 until now, you know, uh, people still using Right. I, I would even back up a step and say, you know, one more driver for the data lake is, you know, enterprise data warehouses worked very well, but that almost led to kind of a, I don't want to say monopolization of the architecture. And, you know, you had companies like Oracle and Teradata that had exploded by the proliferation of the data warehouse. But when you design those data warehouses, you've designed for peak capacity and you have specialized hardware and it gets to be a very expensive thing. And, you know, to your point, Sean, is we saw those three Vs start to explode in the early 2000s is now we had different streams of data. We had more unstructured data and especially just with the rise of the web, larger data that those enterprise data warehouses just became ultra expensive, right? So the data lake was positioned as a, a cheaper way at least to hold your data and to give you more flexibility in what you can hold um, and even to do things like streaming. I, and to your, oh, go ahead, Sean. No, I, I think that's, that's absolutely true. It gave you uh, different ways for you to acquire data. Um, I think the importance of storing it, no matter what it was, uh, one of the things it did there is it eliminated the need to do T, the ETL transformation before you got it introduced into this technology you were going to use ultimately to persist it, to store it. So it wasn't, wasn't meaning that you weren't going to transform that at some point for business purposes, but you didn't need to do it in order to bring the data into the environment. Um, and to piggyback off what you're saying, you also had at least this concept of scalability but it, it, uh, in its initial implementation, it was still driven by on-premise uh, hardware, commodity hardware, right? So you talked about um, machines and, and uh, I forget what word you used, uh, appliances that were specific to uh, certain data technologies. So big data, again, synonymous at the time with Hadoop said, hey, use commodity hardware, it would be quote, cheaper. And, um, but your scalability was still only as fast as you could procure that hardware, get it racked, get the binaries for the system deployed to it, and then get data replicated off um, in, into using it. So you were still a little bit constrained um, from, uh, from it. So then at the same time, you had the introduction of cloud. And so cloud was saying, hey, let's leverage this. Let's, let's uh, use the fact that we already have all of this hardware racked and in place. And so we can scale even faster than you can. And, and let's, let's use the technology as a way to offer data lake like solutions, um, which was pretty disruptive at, at the time. And I can't pinpoint a date, but we'll say 2015, 2016, what, 2017, somewhere in that time where you have Google Cloud Platform and AWS and Amazon, uh, really in the reverse order I just stated, that would introduce these particular capabilities for consumption, you know, um, from from other users. So, so that's sort of kind of where we're at a little bit even now. I feel like, except 2020, um, Databricks, you guys do a white paper on things that you're working on to answer the next business problem, right? This evolution of data architecture for these analytic problems or these uh, analytic workloads. So describe for me Lake House and the, the benefits of this type of architecture for these types of workloads. Yeah, I think what we saw, you know, as a company in Databricks over the past few years is, you know, we've sold Spark, Apache Spark technology very well. Uh, we sold the idea of commodity storage in the cloud, like with S3 or ADLS, Blob Store. And uh, it's worked really well for companies that have the right skill set and can throw engineers at the problem to really make that data lake work well. The challenge that we saw, and I think that a lot of people have seen, is that not all the tech was there to really make the lake house seamless and easy to use. Mm -hmm. There were a number of challenges that, that uh, came up with regards to data quality, you know, reliability performance. So the data lake was fantastic for 
you know, as we said, for the batch processing and even for things like machine learning, right? You look at where the data lake came from, you know, at places like Google, you want to run something like um, PageRank, right? Or, you know, it got used for things like the, the Netflix prize competition, where now you're able to bring machine learning in and solve problems that really you couldn't solve before. Um, so the data lake was great for that, but the only companies that were really successful with that were the ones that had the engineering skill and horsepower to put a bunch of, you know, custom solutions in place on top of the data lake to solve those data governance challenges. So what you needed was a little bit of more refinement to the, the, the data lake itself to make it, you know, to be able to defend it from some of the just accusations that the data warehouse community was throwing at it, like it's too hard to engineer, doesn't perform well, and in particular, like the, the BI workloads that data warehouses are really built to handle. I don't think anybody ever really figured out how to make those work well on the data lake. I mean, there are lots of connectors from the BI tools to different data lake technologies, but I don't think anybody would say the best way to serve out your Tableau dashboard is to put it on Hadoop. Right, that, that just wasn't the best practice. But what if you could? What if you could put your data in a data lake, right? Store it in open source technology, like something based on Apache Parquet, for example, and get performance that's close to uh, what you get with the data with a data warehouse. Well, now what does that buy you? Well, one, it means you don't have to split your architecture, right? You can have your batch workloads, your machine learning your streaming, you know, as you usually would in the data lake, but you can use the same tables, the same uh, databases in your, in your data lake to serve out your BI workloads as well. So that's one of the key concepts, Sean, in the, the paper that you referenced. Um, and this is powered, you know, in Databricks, we've open sourced a product called Delta Lake, uh, which is essentially an iteration on Apache Parquet as a, a columnar, you know, highly scalable, uh, storage format for data lakes. Um, and there are others out there as well, like uh, Iceberg and, and Hootie, for example, are two other examples of uh, uh, similar uh, storage formats. Um, but we'll, we'll focus on Delta because uh, that's what uh, we typically advise through Databricks. Um, so what that does is you, you have one architecture, mm -hmm. so you don't have to have different personas managing a warehouse and a data lake. And you don't have to split your data, so it's easier to manage. And again, going back to sort of the commodity hardware thing and the cheap storage and the ability to spin up compute on demand versus having like a dedicated fixed footprint for compute, you get much better price performance, right? And so you can see like, yeah, I might not always be strictly faster than a data warehouse to run you know, a, a BI query or to run a, a SQL workload, but I'll be in the same ballpark and I can do it at much lower cost now using Lakehouse and my data is trustable. So it delivers things that, uh, that the typical persona coming to the data wa warehouse would like, but that they couldn't get from the data lake while still maintaining all the things about the data lake that have really revolutionized the <clears throat> I like the ML AI value propositions that mostly the big enterprises have been capturing up to this point. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the reasons why, um, you know, 2015, I leave the space that we originally started with talking about working for, um, you know, a, a government uh, initiative, getting into consulting, capitalizing on the experience of using, uh, in this case, Hadoop fairly, fairly early knowing that a lot of companies wanted to be able to leverage a lot of different types of data, ease the entry of data into this environment. So capitalize on that 2015 and growing out a practice around that that's you know, evolved over time. But to your point, there's a couple of things that interest me in what you said. Um, one is that when you talk about the evolution of data architectures for these type of workloads, it wasn't enterprise data warehouse to data lake, it was taking data lake and kind of put it underneath what was the enterprise data warehouse. And you still had some type of a data warehouse technology because performance, SQL performance for business intelligence workloads, you referenced Tableau, whatever consumption tool you were using, um, wasn't quote unquote 
fast enough, you know, for, uh, for the business. And picking them off of the fast enough, what I see a lot of times as a technologist is that companies, product companies look to compete in that performance. I am X times faster than um, this or that. And they're using that as a value proposition. And I understand that because if, if you can get data to a consumer faster, maybe they can make a decision faster. Maybe you can speed up how you exchange data, a bunch of stuff, right? But, but to your point, you said it in a couple of different ways. I think the first time you said close to, SQL performance close to. And as someone that would come now from a business perspective, that's very, very important. I think that's a very, very strong thing to consider because if you can meet business demand, right? By that close to, meaning I might not be the fastest MPP product for your BI platform. However, you now don't have to manage multiple technologies. You don't have to persist data in multiple locations. It becomes easier to implement data management practices of which governance is a part of, to your point. And that's a strong value proposition for, for people with a business mindset. It might not be something technologists like to hear because they always want sort of the, the oh, I want the most efficient storage thing or the most, the fastest thing or the newest thing. But in the space, I, I think, would you agree the space we're in now it's not, it's not technology. It's not technologists that are driving the adoption of these things. It's the realization that business leaders can make better decisions based upon these types of analytic workloads. I don't care about the maturity level. I don't care if it's a report or if it's a predictive model. They know they can make better decisions off, off of it. They're now dependent upon these and they're the drivers of, um, of these particular technologies. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I, in general, yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, this is super cliched, but, you know, people say data is the new oil, right? We've yeah. seen that the companies that harness it and understand their data are much more competitive than those that don't. So the faster you can turn around results off of the data that you have, you know, the faster you can get products to market, the faster you can detect problems in your, your operations, um, the, the, you know, you can do things like drug discovery. I mean, you name it, like there, there are more and more frameworks and solutions out there now for solving uh, what used to be manual efforts now using data and automating, right? So the, the easier it is for your team to access the data, to trust the data, and then to, you know, transform it, whether it's through BI, whether it's through machine learning, to your point, Sean, it's not necessarily you just need one or the other. Um, I mean, that's a huge advantage. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen that, I think, in, in corporate America uh, over the past decade. Yeah. So looking back at this, this evolution, um, there were, there were uh, benefits to each of these new technologies in the way to support analytic workloads. But there are also some barriers of adoption, right? to each of these. So if we go back um, to just the lake house, let's just go in the middle of this evolution that we're talking about between EDW or not lake house, data lake and then lake house. So if we go back to the data lake concept, you pointed out one of the main barriers and I actually did a conference where I had went through and listed some of the main barriers and this was in maybe 2016. And at that point, so we're still, let's say five years into um, adoption of data lakes, the predominant two were all around human capital is around people is finding the resources and having the right skill sets in, in those resources. Looking yeah. at Lake House, right? And let's just say we're one year into um, what's described as Lake House. What do you feel like are the current barriers or, uh, or, or adoptions that is needed for for a lake house architecture to start to kind of move into and become the kind of common way you support analytic workloads? Yeah, so the tech is one piece, which is still evolving. Um, I mean, obviously at Databricks, this is what we're all about right now is making the lake house work. So for example, closing the gap on performance for SQL workloads is really important. So we have 
you know, dozens, hundreds of engineers working on just that problem. And, and you know, we've released some benchmark results and have customers that are now seeing fantastic performance on their BI and SQL workloads by going directly through, you know, our, what used to be just, uh, you know, Spark clusters um, to, to query the data out of the Delta Lake, right? So, so that's one um, on the technology side. And then, you know, making sure that you have discoverability, that you have all the management layers around it. Um, so, you know, if you're in the enterprise data warehousing world, you're used to using things like, um, like a catalog, right? And, and using uh, uh, ACLs, access controls um, on, on that, on your tables so that you have the sort of granular control over who can access what. Um, so that's really important. And I mean, there have been solutions on that, for that in the data lake. Um, what we're doing now with Lakehouse is gonna be even better because you sort of have to merge the storage layer and the, the logical layer together. And so um, that's you know, another gap that, that we're trying to close uh, at Databricks. Um, and, and I think another barrier, Sean, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, I think there's a lot of misconception in, in industry about what Lakehouse is. We've seen you know, people that are really wedded to the data warehouse concept um, kind of throws some fear, uncertainty, and doubt at the lake house and say it's really just the data lake. There's nothing new here, nothing to see. Um, and so they might have some historical reasons for, for saying that, but you know, th there are some distinct differences that I think will make the lake house actually work. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thing there, Tim, um, because I think it's the same objections that I heard. 2010, 2011 um, of those uh, same individuals, organization technologists throwing stuff at, you know, the data lake concept. And it, it's not a big leap to, to see where you guys got to in the lake house. Like you can, you can kind of take the name that was put together there and see what's going after, right? It's, it's a combination of data warehouse and, and data lake. Um, what I will say is I think some of those objections fall a little bit flatter today than they did in, in 2010 and 2011. And the main reason why is because uh, Data Lake did promise a few different things, but one of those was this single source, the ability to run all types of workloads. Um, and it wasn't that it couldn't necessarily do it. You just, to your point, you didn't have the performance. Like you weren't gonna be able to make, meet the business desires of some of those analytic workloads. We talked about business intelligence workloads predominantly, SQL uh, workloads. I think it delivered the promise to run machine learning. Like it delivered on that particular promise. It delivered on scalable storage, compute, all of those things. It just didn't deliver on, on the SQL interaction. And that's why you have now implementations of um, data lakes that still have a data warehouse presence. So I look at the um, the evolution of technology with, with this as the ability to fulfill that promise, the ability to fulfill the promise, you know, that, 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 uh, data lake kind of promised at 2010. That's a, the way I sort of look at it. So to me, there's like less for those that, um, position themselves against these types of technologies for analytic workloads than there was before, because over the past decade, that um, that gap is being fulfilled. And I think you're right. I think that's the barrier to adoption is the proof that that gap has been fulfilled, been fulfilled. So here's a question. Uh, working at Databricks, living in Lake House, can you talk about a, a or a couple of use cases um, so that those that listen today maybe have some grounds that, that, uh, kind of help provide evidence to the fulfillment uh, of the lake house concept. Yeah, sure. It, um, I mean, if you go to Databricks customers page, you can see, you know, a lot of public reference, referenceable customers um, that, that will share their stories. And, you know, you'll recognize a lot of names on there. Um, I mean, I, I, I'll share just one um, from, uh, they actually gave a keynote talk at Spark and AI Summit last year talking about Starbucks. Um, you know, they had sort of had their own proprietary build for their 
uh, really for, for capturing the entire customer journey and for personalizing things for, for their customers. So there's a whole, there's streaming, right? There's data warehousing, there's machine learning, right? They, they cover the full gamut of operations that, that we talk about, whether it's data warehouse or data lake. Um, and you know, what they found is when they moved it into, into Databricks, and this is on, on Azure, um, they found that they got tremendous productivity boosts and, and operational cost savings. Again, for that reason of not having to split your data or split your people across different technologies, right? So if that lake house can, can one, provide the single source of truth and two, unify the people, right? You see both the operational cost savings as well as the productivity boost and the increased business value. And that was something that they talked about quite a bit in the, um, the Spark and AI Summit keynote last year. Um, and I'll share one other, uh, again, Sean, we've met right through doing work in the, the federal sure. space. And uh, yep. you've talked about customers. I work, I work with some of the same customers. Um, yeah, that's how I twisted your arm to get on here. Why would I why, why <laughs> go to uh, do a podcast with this random guy? Um, but yeah, we've, we've done... Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've already spoken in the past about these technology, about the use as it relates to our federal customers and stuff like that. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the sort of signature lake house uh, implementations that we've done in, in uh, the federal space is um, with DHS, and they also talked about this at Spark and AI Summit, so you can see the, <laughs> the talk out there. Um, but, you know, they modernized from, again, a, a world where they were primarily in a data warehouse <clears throat> using, I think, Oracle and, you know, running a lot of analytics on top of that, um, using things like SAS, hooking up Tableau to it. Um, and let me make sure I get the numbers on this right. They've, they've migrated, you know, the vast majority of that now into Databricks and, <clears throat> you know, to highlight the fact that you can support BI uh, from a lake house, um, you know they were they were seeing that um, you know they have over I think it's three thousand users that are Tableau users that are running off of the uh, the lake house right so using Databricks and Delta Lake underneath and then the combination of live and um, extracted uh, Tableau dashboards for for their users. And uh, it's a it's a well oiled machine, and and uh, you know they've they've gotten great value out of that, and keep adding use cases to it. So it works. I mean, we see it working. You know, obviously here in federal, but all around the world, you know, every industry, every vertical. Well, Tim, I appreciate you uh, hanging out here. You have to you know use a use case of Starbucks. We're recording this in the morning time uh, for 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 those that are listening in. So now I'm craving coffee. Thanks for that. Um, but I appreciate you, you know, jumping in and, uh, and hanging out. I will tell uh, anyone for any listeners, uh, if they have any questions, obviously the name of this podcast is called Asking Anything. So you have multiple ways you can reach out and fire in questions. Uh, and I definitely can get those questions to Tim as well. So if you have any questions as a byproduct of this conversation, um, please reach out. Um, I'm looking forward to this next evolution. Like what's coming next, you know, after we, we get to this point of these promises of data architecture where everything is living in one place, where uh, it's doing all of the workloads, where we're easing data management. Um, it, would, it makes so many lives easier that are responsible for delivering data and analytic products. Coming from a time where I had to custom build stuff in a Hadoop environment, uh, I think, you know, I can speak for a lot of people that were ready sort of for the easy button. Um, and I think this is one of the steps toward that. This is a step toward having this easy button. And it's great to have, you know, partners like Databricks that are investing a lot into um, technology to solve these business problems, right? Uh, we talk a lot of time, it's data is not the purpose, it's for a purpose. And the recognition that we're looking to ease, we're looking to ease some of the pain to get to these outputs. Um, I appreciate all the investment, you know, that uh, you have your time, not only, but your organization's time in that. Uh, I appreciate you jumping on here and, you know, having this conversation, talking about the evolution of, uh, of data architecture. You have any closing uh, thoughts? 
No, I, I appreciate that, Sean. We certainly enjoy working with the Moser team as well. And, uh, you know, obviously you guys have such a great grasp of, of the technology as well as how to work with customers. So pleasure talking with you today. And yeah, I agree. It's going to be exciting to see how things evolve in the next couple of years. And, you know, there's sort of a battle going on. And, you know, I certainly have, uh, you know, my uh, I'm, I'm hitched to one horse and I hope that one wins out. Um, but yeah, the exciting thing is really seeing how people get value. And uh, I, I get to work on that every day and really thankful to be in this space. Feel a little bit spoiled that, you know, I was able to skip some of the pains that you mentioned, right? Like, you know, when I when I came in, the only way to, when I came into the space, the only way to really write your your uh, your analytics at scale was to use MapReduce and, and, and Java and writing in Pig. And I just, you know, I kind of said a big no thank you to that and kind of waited till Spark caught up and, and provided, you know, the, the Python and SQL APIs. Um, so it's uh, it's just great and, and hope that, you know, what we're doing, especially in the open source world, empowers other people to, uh, you know, jump into this game and, and deliver value to their organizations. Yeah, thank you, Tim. I you, you just, you know, now I want coffee from Starbucks and I'm also rehashing, you know, this life that I lived where, you know, those first three models we did in that FPS system were MapReduce, PIG, and UDF. So user-defined functions that you had to create because they didn't exist within the technologies that I just referenced. So that's why I say I'm for the easy button, you know, and, and living it the hard way, it allows us to appreciate these advancements that are making. Um, for those that are listening, um, this was a sort of a one-off for data and analytics. We've been focusing in on really uh, data and analytics strategy. Uh, the next podcast that will come back, we'll get back on track. Um, covering some of those key concepts for leaders that are in the data space. Again, thanks, Tim, uh, for joining. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see everybody next time on Ask Anything. Thank you for listening in to this week's edition of Ask Anything presented by Mosher Consulting. We hope you enjoy Sean and Tim's conversation on data and analytics. We'd love it if you join us next week when we continue to dive deeper with our resident experts and what they're currently working on. In the meantime, please remember to give us a rating and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, so long, everybody.